Thank you, Dr. Lan. So our next um, presentation is just gonna go over, a little bit over 12, but hopefully we'll hang in there and um, then we have a wonderful lunch that follows. Um, so as a rural community, we know that there's many personal, family, and social issues that affect the well-being of our patients and families in conjunction with the complex medical uh, conditions. Each affects the other, and we need to look at both the big picture and the personalization of the situation to help us explore and appreciate some of the social determinants of health which impact our patients. I'd like to introduce two colleagues from the Kidney Foundation. Shannon Fogorowski is the Director of Programs and Public Policy from Ontario Branch. Shannon has a social work background. Heather Johnson is the Director of Programs of BC and Yukon Branch. Heather has been instrumental in developing various services for BC renal patients. Shannon will share an overview of social determinants of health particularly with the financial burdens of chronic kidney disease, and Heather will provide the BC context. And uh, if we can save the questions for the end, please. Please welcome Shannon and Heather. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's uh, quite an honor to be here and listening to a lot of the uh, quality improvement um, initiatives that BC has taken on. And I can honestly say that you're quite the leader across uh, the nation because uh, I know for myself, I'm probably one of those statistics that are on the website constantly looking, uh, seeing how we can uh, borrow and uh, augment some of the great work that you do. So I just really wanted to say thank you to um, the phenomenal work that you do do. And uh, we're uh, certainly utilizing a lot of your resources um, uh, in Ontario as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the interrelation. Oh, I think this is actually Heather's presentation first. Sorry, just one second here. Do, we, do you want me to skip through it all to, to mine? Or would you like to speak from the BC perspective first? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. And I'll be back. <laughs> minor, minor glitch here. Um, actually, I want to tell you a story. It's about Joyce. Joyce was diagnosed with CKD four years ago. She's a single mother with an eight-year-old son. Before her diagnosis, she didn't really know anything about the importance of kidney health, but once she was diagnosed, she changed her diet, she started getting more exercise, she controlled her weight. However, her kidney disease progressed to the point that she needed to go on dialysis. She chose in-center hemodialysis and hoped that she would still be able to work. Her employer was willing to adjust her schedule to accommodate her dialysis runs, but Joyce was feeling so much fatigue that she had to reduce her hours significantly. As a single mother, she had no other family income to rely upon. Eventually, Joyce could no longer work, but was able to go on medical EI. That, however, reduced her income by over 50%. She was struggling. When her car broke down, the one she used to get to dialysis, she talked to her renal social worker who was able to secure a crisis grant from the Kidney Foundation to assist with those costs. She struggled to make ends meet, and life was different. She couldn't afford hockey equipment for her son, and she started having to use the food bank. One day she got a call that she could be a candidate for a kidney transplant assessment, but there were a few steps she had to take before that could happen. One was to see a dentist and ensure that any needed dental work was completed. Joyce didn't have a dental plan and couldn't afford these costs. She was wondering if this would mean that she could no longer move forward towards a transplant. By now, Joyce was used to being creative regarding expenses. She reached out to other service groups in her local community, and she was lucky enough to get sponsored for the dental work that she did need. Now she had to figure out how to get to Vancouver for the transplant assessment. She didn't know if she could afford the cost for that kind of travel. The Kidney Foundation was able to supply some gas cards and cover accommodation costs for her to make the trip. She got a report that she was, in fact, a, a candidate for transplant. 
and happily since then she has received a deceased donor kidney transplant and has recovered well. She's optimistic about returning to work, but she is still feeling the impact of the financial burden of chronic kidney disease. Now, Joyce is a composite of patients that I have heard about personally through 11 years working at the Kidney Foundation and administering support to chronic kidney disease patients that meet our financial criteria. So this slide's been up for a while. We all know the, the interrelationship between chronic kidney disease and an ec uh, economic well-being. And sadly, the kind of expenses incurred by CKD patients often come at a time when people are less able to work, uh, maybe even having to leave the workforce, or a caregiver has to take time off work to support them. Um, <clears throat> Substantial costs, these are obvious, relating to the management of CKD. It can be, as already mentioned, dental or home care, um, supplemental food costs. There's a lot of expenses that people might not think about at the beginning of this renal journey. Now, in Canada, a lot of people wind up on disability because of chronic kidney disease. $217 million a year, about $28 million for BC residents. Um, more than that, um, people are on PWD, persons with disability, which I believe for a single person is about $1,133 a month. So it's, it's quite a hit when somebody can't work because of chronic kidney disease. At the Kidney Foundation, the second largest expense for our budgets across the country is financial assistance to kidney patients. But it's not enough. It's only for those people that are very low income. The BC and Yukon branch spends about $100,000 a year and supports about 400 people through our short-term financial assistance program. But those that are still low income but above our criteria, they're fending for themselves. Now, we're fortunate in BC that um, all electrical and plumbing installation costs um, relating to home dialysis are covered by BC Renal, which is fantastic. Um, however, there's often hydro expenses and water expenses that people need to know about if they're going on home therapies. Um, Ontario actually has some municipalities that forgive additional water costs. But <clears throat> BC doesn't seem to. I phoned around to some major centers, and if they're on metered water, um, people just have to pay the difference. Um, <clears throat> some of you may have noticed on your hydro bill that there's a new fee, and it's called the Customer Crisis Fund. What this is for is um, BC Hydro decided they didn't want to keep cutting people off from hydro. And so this crisis fund is building up and it's offering some forgiveness to people that are low income, that have not been able to pay their hydro bills and would like as a one-off to be able to be forgiven some of that outstanding debt. So as long as the debt is less than uh, $1,000, people can be forgiven up to $600. This would be a one-time grant from BC Hydro. So because they've recognized that people do incur additional expenses with hydro. Um, this is one, one recourse in BC. Um, one of the things that I've been concerned about for a long time is dental costs, because a lot of countries that have universal health care include dental in that, but Canada doesn't. <clears throat> and it, it's a health concern. And one of the things, like Joyce, um, you may be on track to be assessed for transplant, but dental can be very expensive. And certainly the renal social workers in the, in the room will recognize that some people have to have all their teeth removed and dentures. They have to have crowns and root canals. Very, very expensive. Um, and this, this is something that um, I'll talk about in a minute that the Kidney Foundation would like to do some advocacy around. Um, the, there's a new program, and it's very short term. So if anyone wants their patients to access it, they'd have to get on it right away. It's only until January 31st of 2019, 
but it's a new pilot project with the uh, BC Dental Association and the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty. So you can refer patients to this program and they can get up to $1,000 of dental work done. Um, hopefully they'll realize the importance of it and maybe the pilot project would, uh, would become something long term. Um, <clears throat> when I first heard about this, there was a second page to the information and there was this whole list of um, conditions and I'm used to seeing Oh, it's a pre-existing condition, so you don't qualify. But in fact, those were pre-existing conditions that you had to have in order to access this program. So if you have unstable renal disease under active management and you're getting disability or income assistance, you can apply for that, that program. We know about transportation, what a problem it is in this huge province of ours. Um, people having travel long distance for dialysis. Um, <clears throat> many patients must consider the costs of travel and accommodation if they're going to train for uh, home dialysis therapies. Um, as it happens, uh, St. Paul's Hospital, um, Providence Health, they're actually looking at this and trying to figure out ways to support people with travel. So perhaps more people would be able to consider home dialysis um, therapies. Medication BC far and away is trendsetters and role models for the rest of um, the country. So, uh, Saskatchewan has a bit of a program, but certainly I'm sure Shannon will take back information for Ontario because um, a great job is done here with providing medications for renal patients. Um, <clears throat> some of you know that the Fair Pharmacare program is going to be improved for low-income people next year, and this is great news. So there'll be no deductible for prescriptions to families with a household income of less than 30,000. Um, <clears> of course, everyone has to file their income tax in order to qualify for Fair Pharmacare. Um, we've tried to help with accommodation costs because we know this is another financial hit for CKD patients. Someone comes for transplant, you've gotta come you know, Ontario actually has a number of transplant sites around the province, but everyone comes to Vancouver for transplantation. And um, kidney patients are told they need to stay about two months, maybe longer, um, post-transplant. So in the year 2000, we realized we should do something, and we, we opened our first suite, and now we have seven uh, kidney suites. And that has been just about the right amount of kidney suites to um, book people in for a month or two, whatever they need post-transplant. People that are low income can stay for free, and people that are above our criteria currently just pay $25 a night. Um, this was the first year this summer, maybe more transplants were done. Um, maybe they were more out of town people that needed a suite, that we had a wait list. And oh, that, really, that really hurt us because we were trying to shoe shoehorn people into these suites as much as possible because otherwise people were paying thousands of dollars for hotels. Um, we know that food costs can be an issue for people with chronic kidney disease. It might be more expensive uh, renal diet um, than just having a regular old diet like the rest of us. And we've talked a bit about out-of-country travel. Mike mentioned that um, people with the portable dialysis machine can travel. Um, the Kidney Foundation does offer $1,000 interest-free loans for hemodialysis patients that travel. But you can see there that BC Medical will compensate, reimburse people for their expenses but up to $462 per hemodialysis run. Um, and certainly there's many places around the world where you're going to be paying more than that. So there's a financial burden if you're on hemodialysis and want to travel. But, you know, lighter portable hemodialysis machines and airlines that are, um, have been asked to be accommodating, um, that, that seems to be working. Travel insurance is an issue for people. If people can even get travel insurance with a pre-existing condition, they're going to be paying more for it. Yet another financial burden. 
So over the last five years, we've realized that a lot of our funds go towards supporting people with accommodation and travel. That's usually gas cards and some accommodation hotels. Um, we do make exception for people with extraordinary travel because the province is so big and it's $1,200 grant in a calendar year. Typically that's people that need to go to a bigger urban center for fistula creation or transplant assessment, post-transplant follow-up and, and the home dialysis training as well. So there's a few things that really strike us, and probably you guys as well, but definitely the Kidney Foundation, that how can we help reduce the financial burden of traveling to and from dialysis, which is very costly for many people in remote areas, traveling for home dialysis training, and this dental costs, which is something that really concerns me, people having to incur those costs before they can move on for transplant. So I would just put it out to you, we have a booth out there, the Kidney Foundation, and if anyone has ideas about how we, what we can do better with limited resources to support kidney patients in BC, um, we're absolutely open to hear, hear that. Thank you. Thank you. We're just um, trying to get the next presentation up. There was a little bit of a mistake, so come on up, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. Um, you know, I've been in the nephrology world for about 18 years. I started off as being a nephrology social worker, and my son always said that I had the greatest job in the world because I was kind of like a, a magician trying to make the impossible seem possible. And it's phenomenal now, um, you know, in the work that I do, I'm very involved with the what's called the Ontario Real Network, um, in difference of, but similarities in, to, in terms of your um, BC renal agency and in terms of looking at uh, provincial pro uh, quality improvement improvement initiatives for our 27 regional centers. So our system kind of works a little bit differently, um, but we still um, look uh, towards BC a lot in terms of your quality improvement indicators and how we can augment that for Ontario as well. So it's great being now at the Kidney Foundation and being in a, in a role where I get to bring that rich uh, frontline experience um, and my experience in leadership and be able to try and affect change in creating uh, provincial programs, but also in looking at uh, um, you know, provincial strategies and looking at public policy and really working with our elected officials to try and create some advocacy piece. So I'm going to talk a little bit about social determinants of health, and we really need to start off with a definition of what that means. And really it means that um, it's the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, age, the wider sets of forces and systems shaping the conditions of everyday life. And these forces and systems include economic policies, uh, systems, developed agendas, social norms, social policy, and our uh, political system. And there's been a, a few, um, a few um, studies that have been done in terms of um, you know, the main social determinants of health, there's relatively about 14, I'd argue probably um, we can also include when we start looking at diversity issues as well. Um, and the National Kidney Foundation in the States also looked more in terms from a, from a renal uh, specific. Um, for the nature of this talk, as I appreciate that I'm between you and lunch, so I'm only going to be talking about a few of them uh, that really hit home uh, to many of us. And a lot of that is talking about our healthcare system. We heard it mentioned a little bit between the difference of equity versus equality, and meaning that we want to have a healthcare that uh, meets the needs of the individual. Looking at uh, psychosocial issues and coping as a, a significant um, social determinant of health for a lot of our patients. Uh, health literacy, which is phenomenal. Uh, I would argue that geography, access to resource, and obviously looking at poverty issues and how that impacts. Uh, so when we think about things, um, the Canadian Health Act requires provinces to provide all medical necessity services on a universal basis, and uh, that's quite comprehensive. And in fact, it's more of a, of a, of a fundling uh, process uh, down from the from the federal to each of the province. Um, however, you know, when you look at things from a national perspective, different things, different services are, um, you know. Uh, 
accessible and not accessible. And uh, one of the challenges too that, and I'm not sure if you've experienced this as much in BC, but it certainly happens in Ontario and other provinces, is that there's a lack of uh, primary care resources that are available. And so um, patients are really struggling and looking at how to access uh, services, whether or not they have to uh, pay a position uh, to be a part of their practice to make sure that they have that relationship, even though that certainly goes against uh, the Canadian Health Act. Um, so when we talk about equity versus equality, um, you know, we look at the National Health Care Act as it's being equal, supposedly equal to everyone, and we certainly acknowledge the fact that different uh, aspects of people's care requires different approaches to care and, and um, that accessibility towards that as well. Um, and so what might appear perfectly equitable may not be exactly what the individual or person needs. Um, and we certainly um, acknowledge that too for, from our perspective when we look at our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations and their um, access to resources that are closer to home. Um, so this just gives more of a comparison chart and we look at um, what the differences between equity and equality means. Um, one of uh, the physicians that I've strongly worked with is Dr. Um, Gavril Hertz, and um, he does a lot of work when he talks about the psychosocial aspects of care and looking at how that impacts people and being able to make medical decisions or informed decisions about their health care. And he talks about the fact that the prevalent approach to managing kidney disease uses a disease model that separates patients from the disease or the problem, and that this model really focuses on identifying the right strategy uh, to solve a mechanical failure. And I think that's... Um, quite true. So when we think about a lot of our, our patients living with chronic kidney disease, um, for many it's really hard for them to come to the terms to understand what's actually happening to them and how this is really going to be impacting their lives. We see this all the time in our pre-dialysis clinics where people are, you know, not prepared to start making on decisions. They're still focusing on that, you know, I need to get back to work, I need to be doing things, I don't understand this language that people are talking about. It's a whole new concept and for many, um, having to come to terms with their chronic illness, it certainly creates a lot of moral distress a lot of situational depression. Um, it has significant impact in terms of families, coping, um, the loss of self, self-identity, self-worth, what it is that I think that I'm gonna be able to do. How am I going to manage being able to go back to work and still take on um, the disease process and how this is impacting me? And it really has significant barriers in terms of one's ability um, to make informed decisions as well. The piece that was really interesting to me is when, you know, you look at a lot of, and, I, and this morning we heard a lot about in terms of some of the education materials that you have in BC that, that really try to diversify and make it accessible for, for individuals to conceptualize. And a lot of your uh, workbooks that I saw that you were talking about, those are certainly things that we're emulating in Ontario. So again, you guys are farther on the curve than we are. But there was a study that was done that talked about, you know, 23,000 Canadians, about 60% of them, you know, still lack the capacity to obtain information and act on health information. And, and these are healthy individuals. These are not our individuals that are dealing with the complexity of their disease and the symptoms and, you know, having to come to di dialysis. And when we think about it really for our patients, we're really forcing them to become um, these significant educators on everything. Right? So they're, they're trying to understand the complexities of their, their medications, uh, the you know, complexities in terms of all the information that's accessible to them about making the right treatment choice and how that's going to impact their lives. Um, you know, and as well, trying to understand uh, their renal diets and specialized diets that they need to take. And so the other piece about health literacy also sort of, you know, looks at the fact about, you know, now we're also encouraging our patients um, from, from a numeracy point of view that they're calculating their blood sugar levels, monitoring their medications, understanding the, what it means in terms of the nutrition labels and how that impacts calculating, um, you know, premiums of co-payments and deductibles and knowing which kind of forms to be able to fill out, understanding monthly budgets and uh, managing a low fixed income. So if you think about it earlier with the study of saying that 60% have a challenge of retaining and maintaining information and understanding the complexities, I figure that's got to be pretty hard for a lot of our patients in dealing with uh, the complexities of their illness and how that's impacting them as well. So the impacts of health literacy and, and poverty, um, 
you know, there's lots of studies that talk about the, you know, the increased hospitalizations, um, the limited awareness of, of, you know, what services and, and programs are available. For many of us, we acknowledge the fact that some of our patients and families are just so exasperated by the whole process that they, it's another barrier and um, they often find that it's a deterrent for them to try and apply. Um, they face greater difficulties in trying to access services, uh, difficulties in filling out forms. Again, a lot of the forms are not accessible in terms of, um, from an adult learner's point of view, language, cultural barriers as well. Um, decision making sometimes on food and meals is based on the availability and accessibility. So it's not always about being able to make those choices and reading the, the um, food labels and understanding the complexity of those things. And another big thing that we deal with a lot in Ontario, and I'm not sure if you deal with it as much here, is when we talk about the insured and uninsured. So from that perspective, there's a number of folks, when you talk about insured, you're looking at um, your drug coverages and long-term um, disability benefits. But for many, it would be either for those that are First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, um, they're not necessarily insured. And then the other aspect, too, for a lot of our um, patients who are OHIP negative um, have a, a exceedingly challenging times in accessing resources and, and health services. So. You know, I think that the, the challenge is, is that it's been very difficult because for, our, for many years we've understood the fact that many of our patients, you know, aren't able to work in the same capacity as they did before. Uh, many of them um, have been able to go back to work, but there's quite a large population who aren't able to be able to go back to work. And, and you know, we've seen that their income has dropped um, quite significantly um, based on the fact of now they're not earning as much as they did one year and the, the next year their income is lower and all the out-of-pocket costs and uh, the challenges that it is sometimes based on the, how their symptoms make them feel but also the complexities of having to come to the hospital so frequently and how the loss of, it, of employment um, ha has really impacted not only from a psychosocial but obviously from a financial point of view. Um, so I think what was really interesting was that this year, um, the Kidney Foundation, as well as uh, the Canadian Association of Nephrology of Social Workers and social workers uh, abroad from the, across the nation, um, it was the first time that we kind of collated this information, understanding that there was such a great complexity, but it never really was documented in any sort of uh, formalized way. And so we had um, done a national survey in talking about some of the out-of-pocket costs that a lot of our patients experience and how that financial burden uh, impacts. Um, so one that came out of that was that we now have a uh, national report in terms of talking about um, some of the out-of-pocket costs and how that's impacted. What was interesting was that, and these are things that we kind of knew, but we didn't really have any uh, data really to support this understanding. And with um, the financial assistance that each of the province uh, gives from the Kidney Foundation, the, great, the need every year is just uh, growing and growing. Um, so it was really time to kind of collate some of this information. And what was uh, very astounding to understand was that 50% indicated that their income uh, decreased since the moment that they started dialysis. And of those respondents, almost and more than half said that it decreased by 40% or more. I mean, that's astounding. So we're, you know, talking about the fact of not being able to work in the same capacity, still having the same, you know, expectations and, and uh, bills that have to be paid, as well as trying to manage, you know, all of the complexities of their health and, and having to come for treatment. Out of all the respondents, 41% um, were below the low income cutoff. And I'm gonna, I found the uh, federal statistic to show you what the actual cutoff is. Um, and that was compared to eight to 14% of, of the general um, population. So when you look at the federal income table, what you'll notice here is that for a single individual, they're calculating that the um, low income cutoff is $24,600. Now, for most of us who are working, that's, you know, quite challenging when you think about the complexity of all the things that we have that are going on in our life, paying for mortgages, you know, raising children, all the, the, the costs of living. Um, what I have, and I don't have, is your, your BC rate, so I'd be very interested to see, but I did um, get permission from one of our patients to show what it is. We have a system called the Ontario Disability Support Program. It, uh, I guess, would be the equivalent of your um, disability uh, welfare system. And what was interesting was, if the federal level was 24600 this individual 
received with all the extra little perks that uh, as social workers were able to try and, and get for our patients was $15,456. Now, if you think about it realistically about how one may survive on that, you think about the complexity of you know, medications that are not covered by your provincial health care system, you're thinking about the specialized renal diets that aren't covered by many systems, um, and then you're looking at you know, housing costs. You're looking at food costs. Um, that's quite astounding when you think about those things. The survey also indicated um, that the average annual income, um, you know, folks, uh, the out-of-pocket costs that they were paying for, and we talk about out-of-pocket out costs, these are things like hospital parking, um, transportation costs to and from your treatment centers um, or for medical tests, um, uh, medications that are not covered by your provincial health care system. Um, people were paying close to between 1,400 and 2,500, um, depending on their modality. 55% of them reported that their household income was less than 35,000, and 23 of them indicated, percent indicated that it was less than 20,000. So it really puts um, you know, a note on when we talk about poverty issues. I'm sure everybody has a similar story. I have Miss Anna. Miss Anna, uh, she's a 43-year-old woman, she was working she was working full time, um, making a fairly decent income. Uh, she's been on dialysis for two years, and due to the complexity of her health, um, you know, uh, she uh, was unable to work. And she had to stop working um, because she just couldn't manage, um, you know, based on how her symptoms were and having to go to dialysis. And so now she's receiving what would be considered a, mon a modest uh, disability pension as well as um, Canada um, disability pension. She brings home about 1600 a month. Um, however, though, um, Based on the complexities of things, and of course, because you know our patients, uh, they have more than one comorbidity often, and so they often have more than one psychosocial factor that impacts them as well. She uh, has an adult son who she is the caregiver of, and um, he has mental health issues. And because of his behaviors, um, he they were no longer able to live in their apartment and were evicted. Um, and the challenge also with Miss Anna is that uh, she is non-weight bearing and uses a motorized scooter, so it's very hard for her to find affordable, accessible housing. Uh, she, unlike most, um, unfortunately is becoming a new reality. She is effectively homeless and she is unable to go into a shelter um, based on you know, the complexities of her treatment needs, how she feels, but she's also afraid of the fact that she won't be able to look after her son and her son will fall through the cracks. So she unfortunately had to find a motel that had a long-term stay that was quite a distance away from her um, available uh, dialysis center. And I use that word available uh, because there's a dialysis spot. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily her closest dialysis treatment. And she uh, is paying close to $2,000 a month, which is exceedingly over her uh, monthly ability. But this is what she feels that she needs to do at this time uh, in order to support her, her son. So as we can see, her debt is only rising. The challenge is, and I'm sure it's quite true here in BC as it is in Ontario, um, the availability of accessible and affordable housing is very limited and in fact sometimes I'd even argue that uh, social housing is really a myth because uh, it's very challenging that many patients actually or individuals um, are able to access it. You know, some of the barriers of accessing health, um, and, and not unlike Miss Anna here, is that most dialysis centers um, are often in urban centers, and so there's uh, challenges for individuals who don't live in the urban center and live more remotely in terms of being able to access transportation systems uh, to get there. And so many individuals are paying higher costs for their transportations. Uh, some of the transportations that are available um, don't actually include a lot of our dialysis patients. Um, in Ontario, um, a lot of the services are based on and I would question more of a, of a visible disability rather than acknowledging that even things like blood pressure um, is quite debilitating to a lot of our patients and you know, are, are not uh, able to access these services. Um, there's huge issues, again, for many of our patients who uh, don't have health care coverage, who are considered either uh, they may have uh, short term based on interim federal health, but once that um, you know, expires or they're, they're no longer eligible, there's significant challenges. And it's a l very limiting in terms of um, diversifying our services that would incorporate a lot of um, 
uh, cultural aspects and as well as language. So a lot of the, the consequences uh, of these issues are obviously are the unmet needs, uh, delays in uh, receiving appropriate care, the inability uh, to get preventative services. And for many of our patients that feel a little bit disenfranchised by the whole process to begin with, often don't seek out the supports that they need because they already feel that they're already going to be disadvantaged from it. And so there's lots of things that we can do from a preventable point of view as well. Uh, I put in here the piece about systematic biases, and I had the caveat there because, um, um, you know, the challenge is, is that many of our patients who are seen to be very challenging um, are often sometimes equated with the same word as uh, non-compliant, and I, I struggle with that word because I often feel that it's uh, non-convenient to us in many ways. Um, and it's about understanding some of the complexities and challenges that they're going through in order to understand sometimes why they're missing their treatments or not uh, following through with a lot of the recommendations that we're offering. When we look at geography as a social determinant of health, I mean, again, we talked about the fact that, um, you know, access to resources, and one of the things that really promoted, um, that came out in the national uh, survey was that many patients are traveling three to four hours to receive treatment, and when you're not feeling well, and you're sitting there for four hours and dealing with the complexity of your health and then having to, to travel such long distances, it's certainly um, quite challenging. And the other piece that came out was that um, across the nation, and in, in different provinces as well, the lack of available, um, accessible, and affordable transit system um, is, is quite impacting. Um, it's not uncommon, I think, for myself to hear of stories where a patient had to travel 96 kilometers because their current uh, dialysis center um, uh, doesn't provide a service, and so they might have to travel the 96 kilometers to get a subcutaneous uh, PD catheter put in. And so we're looking at, you know, how it is that system barriers create that financial bur burden as well. So the other thing that came out of the national study um, is the fact that people are treating one basic necessity of life over another, having to make decisions on do I purchase my medications or do I eat today, and really trying to make those very difficult decisions. And when we think about the fact of, you know, majority of our patients who are unable to work and are receiving some sort of um, provincial disability system uh, for financial support, it's even more compounding in terms of the financial struggle that they're experiencing. So the challenge, I think, is, is that we need to be very inventive and creative in some of our solutions and strategies. I don't think that there is a one-step-all model that's going to, you know, cure a lot of our, our poverty issues for our patients. But I think that there's certain models that we can try to, to emulate. And I think in BC here, you're certainly a, a champion and leading in, in some of the things that you're doing. I think the piece is really trying to educate uh, as much as possible and the way in which that a person understands the information uh, to help them to become more champions and advocates of their health care. And we're starting to see a lot of that shift and change with having patients being more involved in uh, patient family advisor groups, being very involved in uh, co-designs and quality improvement measures, um, but also looking at how do we diversify our education materials so that way um, it caters to the individual and understands um, more and supports more in terms of some of the cultural needs and traditional practices and things. Um, it's also, we're looking at, you know, innovative ways to um, provide um, support and services. So for people who live more in the remote areas, instead of trying to encourage them to travel that far um, to an urban center, if there could be rotating specialist clinics where we have physicians that uh, go, and for us it would be the, you know, uh, quite up north, um, it is quite challenging for, for many people to access services and supports. And the one thing that I acknowledge here in BC is that you're starting to do more, or you have been doing more in terms of telehealth and, and looking at the different um, processes with that. This is something that in Ontario we're just starting to, um, to do as well. And the biggest thing is um, uh, the provincial electronic system. I heard earlier this morning that you're starting with Promise, or you have been working with Promise, and that's something that we're slowly starting to, uh, to copy, so I'm, I'm glad to hear that. So again, in on BC, you have a number of these programs that are already existing. Across the nation, um, we don't have, uh, it's not uh, the same everywhere, so the challenge is sometimes is, is trying to create that um, equality everywhere. And um, we also look at the financial uh, assistance, um, it's about changing tax structures and the way in which that uh, accessibility to applications or programs uh, are available. Um, 
The challenge also is, is that many programs are based on um, notice of assessments that were done in the previous years. I might have been working last year, but this year I'm sick and therefore my income is a lot lower. Um, so looking at how do we change and uh, create more um, processes along that. Um, and then also looking at the, the change process about household income. Uh, again, I think that's a more of a historical notion. Um, when you think about um, the functions of families now, there are many that where it's even my generation that's living with my parents that's looking after their needs. And so my income, although it might be seen as this value, is really lower because of all the complexities of having to take care of my mom who is going for her chemo treatments and my dad who goes for his dialysis treatments and having to pay all those out-of-pocket costs. And so you know, while it has my assessment at this level, it really should be um, identifying all these other challenges as well. Uh, developing a, a medical transportation system program that subsidizes um, transportation costs. Now, I'm a part of, um, which we're hoping, is part of the uh, Chronic Disease Prevention uh, Alliance, and it's really trying to um, connect together a number uh, of chronic disease together in, in a single um, action towards our elected officials and provincial uh, leaders to try and create uh, more awareness. And one of the things that um, from Newfoundland Labrador, one of the things that they do is that they have a, um, a rate of mileage reimbursement um, for um, treatment, and so that would include all forms of treatment, which I, I think is phenomenal. The caveat to that piece would be to ensure that it's not just for those that have uh, a taxable income, because argumentatively it wouldn't be supporting our patients, the majority of them are on non-taxable income, so if there was some sort of uh, per diem rate that that could happen. Um, the other thing that uh, came out of the national report that I've been very involved in is, is also um, creating a kind of like a, a, a an uh, advocacy toolkit about how to get uh, patients and families involved in hearing their voices and stories about how they've experienced financial burden and challenges. Um, and I've been very um, involved with um, uh, an, uh, part of our national pharmacare restructuring in terms of our, our drug formularies and how people are accessing uh, medications. Um, so I was able to be um, at a consultation meeting with Eric Hopkins and be able to um, uh, challenge some of the, the the current structures that they have, and how do we how do we create a national pharmacare program that actually supports uh, the marginalized individuals that we're actually trying to support? So again, it would be like trying to um, look at the evaluations of financial income, re making new definitions on household income and how that's calculated, um, decreasing uh, wait times um, for access to certain medications. Um, making sure that the drug dosing, especially for our nephrology patients, um, that there's a variance there for us to be able to, um, you know, for physicians to be able to prescribe and knowing that their patients are going to be covered. Um, another, another creative solution, well, maybe not be creative, but um, is uh, minimizing the disparities in accessing those medications and food supplements. Um, to offset some of that cost for our patients that have to spend out of pocket um, for uh, a lot of the renal supplements and uh, medications. Um, and develop a mechanism to provide help to patients and family who are incurring those high costs um, related uh, to their income. Um, it was mentioned earlier before about uh, Ontario, we started um, through the Ontario Real Network, uh, the HUG program, the Home Utility Grant. And so there's a certain per diem uh, rate that uh, home dialysis patients will get uh, to help subsidize the cost for their hydro and water consumptions. It's still, um, you know, it certainly is uh, a significant leap. Um, there are some, a bit of challenges with that because it, uh, it challenges for those who are on some sort of disability support program because it's seen as income. It's a bit challenging for some of our folks that live in subsidized housing or um, uh, for some of our landlords that are asking for that, they would like to pocket that subsidy themselves. And so it's in a continual process. Um, I think the other piece that uh, the Ontario Real Network is working on is looking at a subsidy rate for uh, home dialysis training and what that will look like. So slowly we're starting to, to work on some of those out-of-pocket cost issues and looking for creative solutions. I guess I'll stop there. Thank you. I saw that you got up and I thought, oh, okay.